Hello again and welcome to another Warlord Wednesday, the episode of the week where we talk about all things bolt action. So anybody who has watched the film Enemy at the Gates and is into bolt action has at some point considered doing a Red Tide army, a Soviet horde, wave upon wave of inexperienced infantry fixing bayonets and charging at the enemy. And even though the Soviets lose in that part of the film and they all get mown down, you can't help but feel like, I want to recreate that. I want to have all my guys charging forward, not one step backwards, comrades. Hurrah! One man with the rifle, one man with the bullets, the whole nine yards. And so that's what today's video is going to be all about. We are going to build a conscript horde list and we're going to try and make it not only fun and fluffy, but also at least semi-effective on the tabletop. But with all of that said, let us charge forward for the motherland, die gloriously for communism and dive right into today's video. So the first thing that I want to do is lay down some ground rules for building this list. And we're basically going to just keep it to the standard format of the game. That means we're going to have a 1000 point limit. We're going to have 12 order dice max, not including free units. And we're going to have a single platoon. The reason that we're putting these limitations in place is because it will allow us to use this bolt action army not just as a funny meme concept, but something that's actually viable and playable on the tabletop. Most games bolt action involve some kind of points limit or dice limit and platoon limit. So we've gone for the set of limitations that I tend to find are the most common whether you're playing a pickup game with a friend down in your basement back to a bunker maybe you're having a game at your local club or you're going to a tournament or event and just one last thing to mention i am going to be using a single box to build this army we're going to be creating the entire list out of the soviet winter starter set the main reason for doing this is we want this army to be easily accessible and beginner friendly. We don't want people having to scrabble around the internet trying to find all sorts of niche kits. We don't want people having to worry about going down to multiple different sources and different sites trying to put everything together. Let's just build it out of one box and then anybody who just wakes up one morning and goes, you know what, I want to try it by action. Hell, let's do that Soviet horde thing. Or any veteran player that goes, I kind of always wanted this, but I've never really known where to start. And every time I do start, I end up going down a bit of a rabbit hole. No, let's just keep it simple. And that way, everyone can get access to the fun as quickly as possible. But that's enough messing around. Let's get to the exciting bit, which is the list itself. And we're going to begin with the head of the snake, the officer core. Now, our first officer is going to be a senior lieutenant. This is the equivalent of a first lieutenant in lots of other armies. I'm not sure why the Soviets call it senior and junior rather than first and second, but there must be some historical precedent for it, or maybe it's just a quirk of the game bolt action. But regardless of that, we're going for a senior lieutenant. Now, we're doing this for a number of reasons. Firstly, we want that extra leadership. Senior lieutenants are going to give you plus two leadership to units that are nearby. And considering that, as you'll see, we're running a lot of inexperienced infantry. Having a senior lieutenant is going to be vital because we want them to be able to obey their orders. When you're building an army like this, it's tempting to go full meme lord, go for junior lieutenant, go for him and experience, have all your squads just as shirkers, just the whole nine yards. But no, if you do that, all you're going to do is just run a completely ineffective force what we want like i said is something that's actually viable and something that's memed but more themed than anything else another reason why we are taking the senior lieutenant is because we want two snap to actions this is where you pull a dice out of the bag and you go right i'm going to activate my officer and then i'm going to activate a number of extra units around him and the higher the rank of lieutenant the higher amount of dice that you can pull out of the bag and start activating extra units so with a senior that means we can do two 
We're running a lot of bodies, we're running a lot of dice, and we really want to be able to leverage our numbers. We want to be able to pull a dice out of the bag and go, right, let's activate as many units as possible before the enemy starts putting pins on them and before they start essentially being less effective. So we're going for that senior tenant for the extra leadership and for the ability to conduct mass maneuvers. So that's the reason we're taking a senior lieutenant over a junior. Now, just to just be clear about the squad composition, we're going to have the lieutenant. We're going to have one extra man. Both of those are going to be equipped with submachine guns because it's free to do so on your officers. This gives them a little bit more punch, makes it a bit more effective. And we're going to be taking the squad at regular. So it comes in at 85 points in total. We're then bringing a second officer to lead this rabble. And it's one unique to the Soviet Union. It is, of course, the infamous, the dreaded Commissar. Now, these are political officers. They don't confer any kind of leadership bonus, but they are vital if you're running this kind of Soviet horde. Firstly, it's kind of fluffy to do so. But secondly, they allow you to execute a guy and re-roll an order test. So if one of your squads goes for an order test and passes, great, no problem. If they go for the order test and they fail, you can execute a dude, lose a model, and re-roll that order test. Now, re-rolling orders in bot action is amazing. It's a super powerful ability. So to be able to do it so easily with Soviets is pretty nice. What I like about this as well is it means that essentially Soviets just don't really worry about morale anywhere near as much as other armies because between the Commissar making you re-roll your order tests if you want to and the fact that you've got an army rule which allows you to just re-roll morale tests as well essentially your guys even though they're inexperienced are going to have a lot of ways of sticking around doing what they're told and being effective. For the exact composition of this unit, we're going to have a single inexperienced Commissar, because he has to be inexperienced, and he is going to have a submachine gun, and he will be accompanied by one extra man who also has a submachine gun. That is because, like with our Lieutenant, they're free, so why wouldn't you take the best option? Small side note here. If you're a newer player and you're wondering why we're only taking one extra bloke with our officers rather than two, because surely taking two means two extra wounds for the squad, that's better. Well, actually, you want to take your officers either alone or with one extra person. And the reason for this is they're a team unit. And as long as a team unit has two or less people in it, it gets an inbuilt minus one to hit modifier. They're essentially a small target that's difficult to pick out in the Maelstrom of battle. And it's much better to be minus one to hit than to have one extra inexperienced wound, but being hit normally. But speaking of inexperienced wounds, now let's get to the main show, the hot tamale, because we need to talk about the meat of the army, the core. The poor, bloody Soviet conscripts. This list is going to be built on a solid foundation of rifle squads. Each one of these rifle squads is going to be maxed out with 12 men, meaning they are full strength, which again helps feed into making them more reliable. If you're full strength, you get to re-roll an order test if you fail it. it. means you can do that without having to get blammed by the Commissar. Each squad will have an NCO and he will have a rifle and 11 of the blokes with rifles as well. This gives us 12 bodies for 84 points. That is wildly cheap. That is insane. If you look at other armies, they're typically going to have 10 regular guys and that's going to cost them 100 points. So we're getting two more conscripts in our squads than they get men in theirs. And we're going to be 16 points cheaper. And the best bit is each one of these squads is green. This is one of the advantages, I believe, of taking rifle squads over something else like SMG squads. Because there's loads of ways you can take inexperienced infantry in a Soviet army. But often... If you take something that's inexperienced in the Soviet force, it's just plain inexperienced. But rifle squads are green. Now, green is a special kind of inex. 
it means that the first time you take a casualty, you roll a dice. And on a five plus, you are no longer inexperienced. You actually uprate to regular. And considering that we're taking a lot of these squads, statistically, you're guaranteed to get a couple of regular units, regular upgrades for the low, low cost of free. Side note, what's totally bonkers about this rule is there's no stipulation that the first casualty has to come from the enemy. So if you wanted to and you failed an order test, you could use the full strength reroll or you could get your commissar to blow a guy's head off and by doing so, you will lose a casualty and then you will roll to uprate. And so your commissar could potentially kill one of your guys so that the whole squad becomes regular. It's pretty funny. It's a little cheesy. But like I said at the beginning of this video, we're not just going for a total joke list. We're actually trying to build something here which has got all these different layers to it. That means it might be kind of effective on the table. I'm not saying it's going to win any kind of tournaments. But at least you can turn up with this army and not feel like you're just wasting your time and people are just dying all around you and you're not actually achieving anything but if you build a soviet horde like that you can end up just sort of playing it once and going oh that was fun but it totally doesn't really work and i don't want to do it anymore what i want to do with this army is build something which you can pull out regularly and can have a bit of fun with and when you show your friends oh soviet hordes are coming today they're like oh no not the soviet horde and they both you and them know you're in for a good time Anyway, that was a slight tangent. So we're taking this rifle squad, 12 blokes, all green, all rifles, 84 points. And we're going to take six of them. Six? More than you can only get five squads in a regular reinforced platoon. How are you getting six in there? Well, well, welly Wellington. We're getting a six squad because of the Soviet special rules. Quantity has a quality of its own, allows you, no matter what kind of army you're taking, to always get a free rifle squad. And this free rifle squad gets all its upgrades free as well. So they come not only with rifles and green, but they also get anti-tank grenades. This means that between the free rifle squad and the five rifle squads that we're taking in our platoon infantry slots, we are going to have six that's six 12-man squads. That is 72 Russian conscripts. Hurrah! Now that's a proper Soviet horde. A conscript meat wave. If you're a mutable action, to put this into a bit of context, most armies have about 30 to 35 infantry. At a push, they'll have 40 but that might include things like weapon teams and officers as well. We've got 72 in our line infantry alone. This force regularly, easily, should be outnumbering most standard opponents by two to one. If you come across someone who's gone for something particularly elite, maybe you're facing off against some kind of late war German hardcore battle hardened force, you could find yourself outnumbering them three to one when you take into account all of your models, the officers, the weapon teams, the main infantry, and you compare your total body count to their total body count. But despite its overwhelming numbers, this army needs some support teams. Otherwise, it's going to be woefully ineffective. Our first one is the medium machine gun team. The good old Maxim. We're going to give this a gun shield and it's going to be regular so it comes in at 55 points now normally medium machine guns are looked down on a little bit most people say they're pretty ineffective the thing with the soviet one is you do get the gun shield so that makes you a little bit more durable secondly we are using stuff out of that winter army box and we do want to make sure that we're getting dice in the bag which actually contribute to the game I've really turned my opinion around on medium machine guns as well. I've been using them more and more, even at events, and I've been finding them to be semi-effective. I would rather put a medium machine gun in my list than like a medic, because medics are another way you can pad your list out with extra dice, but they never seem to do anything. 
those medium machine guns, at least they can put a little bit of dagger down, they can hold an objective, they tend to be all right. However, if you are thinking of making this list a bit better, a little bit more efficient, the medium machine gun is definitely one area you could improve. Taking maybe a bit more anti-tank or including some kind of uh, extra artillery piece would probably be much more effective than the medium machine gun. But for now, it comes in that winter box. It's not a bad unit. There's just better ones. So we'll pop it in the list and at least we can just shoot down some Germans with it. At the total opposite end spectrum, a unit which is absolutely bloody fantastic and you should never leave home without, we of course have a medium mortar team. Mortars are amazing. They are cheap. They get indirect fire. They also allow you to get HE into your list. They can even do soft anti-tank because you hit them on the top armor. They can threaten anything up to a medium tank. They're just fantastic. Great way of doing extra pins. Great way of being able to hammer your opponent, stopping him from just camping and staying still because otherwise you're going to dial in and hit him. Honestly, you never leave home without the medium mortar and it's brilliant that this starter set includes one. And we've taken it as regular and we've taken a spotter for it. That way it can always do the job we need it to do, which is just lobbing shells at people and blowing them up. But there is one area of our list which is pretty weak right now and that is our anti-tank. And we're going to solve that problem by taking two anti-tank rifle teams. Normally you can only take one, but being Soviets, we can take up to three. In this list, we're just going to take two though for our point's sake. Now, each one of these anti-tank rifle teams is going to come with uh, two guys. They're going to have an anti-tank rifle that's going to have a long range, and it's going to be pen plus two. Now, pen plus two isn't exactly great AT, but the fact that we're taking two of them and combine it with the fact that medium mortars can serve as soft anti-tank because they hit the top armor and we've got a free rifle squad with anti-tank grenades we've actually got four sources of light at in this force that is a lot of different pins that's a lot of different ways that we can threaten tanks sure we're probably not going to knock anything out but just by putting a pin on something it might fail an order test it might go down it might start reversing it just allows you to just constantly be pecking away at your opponent and you can kind of just frustrate enemy tanks into ineffectiveness in bot action and this is what we're doing with list i would say though as we mentioned before if you wanted to get a bit of proper at in here i would consider dropping that medium machine gun and putting in maybe a light anti-tank gun or a light howitzer or maybe a medium anti-tank gun something that can just throw down one big shot but for now using what we've got in this box anti-tank rifles are fine mortars fine anti-tank grenades in that squad is okay to be clear though we're taking each one of these anti-tank rifle teams as veteran these are one of the few veteran units in the force and the reason we're doing this is because we had 18 points left over but also veteran anti-tank rifle teams are surprisingly good they're really annoyingly difficult to dislodge because they're a two-man team. So they've got an inbuilt minus one. So they're inbuilt minus one and they only die on fives. They're really good at just plonking down and a bit of cover and just throwing out those big rounds, those pen plus two. And what I tend to find with them is they're really flexible. So if your opponent's gone for a lot of light tanks, which is actually quite a competitive meta thing to do, things like Panzer twos. Um, you've also got like tankettes, things which are like armor seven plus, which are immune to small arms but anything with a pen value can start threatening them anti-tank rifle teams are really good at dealing with that kind of meta but also if someone starts taking a lot of veteran infantry pen plus two means that you're going to be just knocking those veterans down on a three plus rather than fishing for fives so i find them to be very flexible very effective they're going to struggle against anything bigger than a light tank but they're still able to put some pins down here and there and they're great against a variety of other targets but all of the soft AT in the world will only get you so far. Sometimes you need something with a bit more pop, a bit more zing, some pizzazz, if you will. And we're going to fulfill this need in our list with a KV tank. Now, KVs are heavy vehicles. That means they've got a damage value of 10 plus. I've talked many times about how heavy tanks are not viable until they are. If both players have planned to deal with a medium tank 
but one person turns up with a heavy and you just can't deal with it, it's game changing. Completely shifts the dynamic. And I have seen more than one player lose a game because they just weren't ready to deal with a heavy tank. And I myself have won many games by using things like Tigers. Now, the thing is, a lot of the time, the reason people dismiss heavy tanks is because they're quite expensive. But this is the Soviet Union. Our stuff is cheap. And so what we're going to take is a KV-1S. So there's a couple of different variants of the KV-1. Uh, you've got the base variant, which is like armored all round. It's dead hard. It's really difficult to deal with, but it's like 300 plus points. We don't want that. That's going to take away from the amount of bodies we can field in the list. And it's just not a very good unit, in my opinion. The KV-1S is just a straight up heavy tank. It hasn't got armored all round. It hasn't got any of the fancy rules. It's just a heavy tank that comes with a medium anti tank gun, coax MG, turret mounted rear facing MG, and a forward facing hull mounted MG. Okay, so it just has a lot of DACA and it's got a good old medium AT, which is good enough for us. And it only costs 280 points. That makes it about 70 points cheaper than the regular KV, which is pretty tasty. You could consider the KV too. It does have a heavy howitzer and it is an absolute beast, but it's 20 points more than the KV-1. So you're going to have to make your anti-tank teams regular, which makes them a little bit vulnerable. And even after that, you're going to have to find two more points from somewhere else. Maybe drop the gun shield. It just gets a little faffy. So what I would say, if you're a newer player who just wants to take a tank that bit more reliable, bit more straightforward, bit easier to understand. It's a tank that you shoot at other tanks. It's got machine guns to mow down infantry. Stick with the KV-1S. And with our KV trundling into the list, we actually have our full army. In total, we have got a senior lieutenant and a commissar, both with the extra blokes. That's four infantry there, all with some machine guns. We've then got 72 riflemen bring us up to 76 bodies in total. A medium machine gun, which brings us up to 79. A medium mortar with a spotter, bringing us up to 84. And then we've got two anti-tank rifle teams, bringing us up to 88 infantry and a big old KV heavy tank. We've got numbers and we've got the heavier armor as well. But of course, this is just how I would build a Soviet horde using just one box. Let me know what you guys would do to get the most juice out of the squeeze. What other box sets would you recommend after this one? What units do you think would really benefit this army? Get it all down in that comment section. I'd love to see what crazy Soviet horde armies you guys can come up with. And it's not just Soviets. If you know of another army that can do it, we know Japanese can do it a bit. What about the French? There's all sorts of horde armies out there. Let me know your favorite ones down below. If you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to smash that like button. It really does help with the algorithm. And if you want to see more content like this, then subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is a lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support 
of my members. So thank you guys so much. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the Call of Duty. So a massive thank you to Bomb Bombvert, Ken Starr, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Varney. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. You are incredible. Your generosity is truly humbling. And I could just say it a thousand times over and over again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.